My time has come to die. May God bless you all is my prayer. Bless Jesus, we are almost smothered. Don't know how long we will live, but it is our time to go. I hope to meet you all in heaven. For Jesus' sake, goodbye. Until we meet to part no more. Pal Harmon. My boys never work in the coal mine. Oh God, for one more breath. Coal mining in the Southern Appalachian region, particularly in Tennessee, has been and still is both a dangerous and resourceful industry. In the late 1800s, the convict lease system in Tennessee sparked a revolution during which free miners fought to regain their jobs and livelihoods. The miners' struggle for justice led to the repeal of the lease law in Tennessee, and consequently a reform in coal mining safety. In reaction to the rising standards of mining safety, new procedures were implemented to ensure safety and aid in rescue efforts. The Coal Creek War's lasting legacy is still impacting American industry and industry around the world. On the eve of the Civil War, southern states had to rely upon their natural resources since the ravages of the war had left the region practically bankrupt. Reconstruction found many southern states faced with pressing budget demands, with the need to replace state penitentiaries the recent war had demolished, and with a growing inmate population consisting mainly of freed slaves. Using a small loophole in the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery except in the form of criminal punishment, states were allowed to use convicts for legalized slave labor. Because of abuse, poor care, and lack of training, death rates among lease convicts were approximately 10 times higher than in non lease states. By 1890, America's growing demand for resources to fuel the growing industrial markets transformed East Tennessee's coal industry. As demands grew, so did animosity between miners and the coal companies. Like other southern companies, Tennessee Coal, Iron, and Railroad Company brought in leased convicts to work in their mines. This provoked a revolution among the miners of East and Middle Tennessee from the beginning. Free miners were against the system. Their jobs were being taken by inexperienced criminals, their grievances were ignored, and the lease system amounted to legalized slavery. The first great showdown in the East Tennessee coal fields was in Coal Creek, about 30 miles north of Knoxville. In July of 1891, the Tennessee Mine Company brought 40 convicts to Coal Creek. 300 free miners rallied together and revolted by charging and burning the stockade and sealing the convicts and guards on a train bound for Knoxville. This was the first blow in what would be known across the country and around the world as the Coal Creek War. The miners petitioned Governor John Buchanan to intervene for their cause. They likened their situation to earlier American struggles for liberty and against slavery. The governor agreed to meet with the miners, but then sent the convicts back, along with the entire state militia to subdue the miners' revolt. Three days later, 1,500 miners overpowered the militia and set more convicts free. Similar revolts occurred over the next several months throughout East Tennessee mines. In the violence, miners and military men alike were killed. What had started as a relatively peaceful protest turned into a full revolution. Governor Buchanan promised to work to repeal the despised lease law. In 1892, a truce was reached with the state. The convict lease was legally abolished in Tennessee in 1896. Governor Buchanan lost his bid for re-election. The state's laws were reformed as the new governor signed into law provisions for a new state penitentiary and the convict lease system was abandoned. Tennessee became the first state to end the convict lease system. Its lease period of 25 years was relatively brief compared to the rest of the South. The miners' revolution ultimately brought reform that ended the system. After the miners regained their jobs and well-trained men once more dominated in the mines, the level of safety began to increase. Lives were valued as well as production. The Freighterville mine was known for its exceptional safety record. However, on May 19, 1902, the mine exploded and killed all of the 216 miners who were trapped inside. As the Knoxville Sentinel stated a week after the explosion, such an event strikes horror to us all. Its like must not occur again in a Tennessee mine. The life of the humblest man is more precious than any number of cubes of bituminous coal. The explosion remains one of the most costly mine disasters in American history and made news worldwide, 
which helped lead to the formation of the U.S. Bureau of Mines in 1910. The Bureau's new safety procedures were put to the test on December 9th of 1911, when the neighboring Cross Mountain Mine in Bryceville, Tennessee, exploded and trapped 89 miners inside. Cross Mountain Mine is burning, now the miners are dying. Fall down the snakes, Women are crying. These miners and their sons, they paid you the price. Trying to make a living, now the mines just took their lives. The Cross Mountain Mine disaster was the first time that the Bureau of Mines launched a full scale rescue operation. The efforts of the Bureau were successful and led to the rescue of five trapped miners. The Cross Mountain explosion was the beginning of a reform in mining safety. Not only were five lives saved that day, but new rescue methods were tested and proven successful. In addition to using gas masks and oxygen tanks, the Cross Creek mine disaster marked the first time the federal mine rescuers used canaries in cages to detect dangerous gases in the mine. It was the first successful rescue operation by the Bureau of Mines, and it, it led to, uh, to safer mines today. The rescue following the explosion was a part of a new mindset of mining safety. Several victims from both the Freighterville and Cross Mountain Mine explosions wrote notes to family members as they were dying and waiting to be rescued. Some of them had several hours to spend thinking about their life, praying, uh, making things right with the Lord. That was the last thing he could do was write the instructions to his wife and children what he wanted them to do. These deeply personal and wrenching letters were published in the national press and helped to put a human face on the dire predicament of the miners. This, in turn, helped to bring about further legislative efforts to address mining hazards. The Progressive Era, which lasted from the 1890s to the 1920s, was an age of reform, the nation's response to the Industrial Revolution. In the aftermath, there were demands for enhanced laws to protect worker health and safety. In 1911, 2,658 miners died in mining accidents and disasters in the United States. In 2010, there were 48 mine fatalities and production has doubled. This new view of safety over production has stayed in place and continued to increase, even into recent times. In August of 2010, a mine in Chile collapsed. 33 miners were trapped in the mine for 10 weeks and after extensive and precise rescue procedures were brought to safety all alive. The Coal Creek War made national news and familiarized the general public with the free miners via the national press. Many of the men killed in the Freighterville disaster were veterans of the Coal Creek War and had already gained recognition and sympathy from the nation. This, along with new safety reforms of the Progressive Era, helped make the Freighterville and Cross Mountain disasters the initiators of the mining safety reform. Major reforms brought about by the Coal Creek Revolution will continue to have a lasting impact on safety and the mining industry. Today, the uh, fatality rate for miners is 99% lower than a century ago, and it all began to cross mountain mine. On December 9th, 2011, descendants of miners from the Cross Mountain Mine gathered for a memorial service of the explosion that had happened 100 years ago. The church bell rang 84 times as the names of the miners were called. Their farewell messages were read by family members. At the Cross Mountain Miners Circle Cemetery, Bryceville Elementary School students from this small mining town installed a plaque dedicating the site on the National Historic Register. At the abandoned portal site in Slatestone Hollow, which is now submerged, six American chestnut trees were planted. One for each surviving miner, and one for the rescue crews, from then and now.